Jesus. In his name we pray. Amen. Matthew 18, starting at verse 23. Therefore is the kingdom of heaven likened unto a certain king which would take account of his servants. And when he had begun to reckon, one was brought unto him which owed him 10,000 talents. But for as much as he had not to pay, his Lord commanded him to be sold, and his wife, and children, and, and all that he had, and payment to be made. The servant, therefore, fell down and worshipped him, saying, Lord, have patience with me, and I will pay thee all. Then the Lord of that servant was moved with compassion, and loosed him, and forgave him the debt. But the same servant went out, and found one of his fellow servants, which owed him an a hundred pence. And he laid hands on him and took him by the throat, saying, Pay me that thou owest. And his fellow servant fell down at his feet and besought him, saying, Have patience with me, and I will pay thee all. And he would not, but went and cast him into prison till he should pay the debt. So when his fellow servants saw what was done, they were very sorry, and came and told unto their Lord all that was done. Then his Lord, after that he had called him, said unto him, O thou wicked servant, I forgave thee all thy debt, because thou desirest me. Shouldest not thou also have had compassion on thy fellow servant, even as I had pity on thee? And his Lord was wroth, and delivered him to the tormentors, till he should pay all that was due unto him. So likewise shall my heavenly Father do also unto you, if ye from your hearts forgive not every man, every one his brother their trespasses. And you may be seated. Well, Jesus told this story to Peter in response to a question about how often do I need to forgive someone? And basically, Peter was wondering, how much grace do I need to extend? And in addition to that, maybe he was wondering, how often can I be forgiven? Now, Peter was aware of the customary tradition of the day where, based on um, a conversation that the Lord had with the prophet Amos, they interpreted that to mean that there was three times that you needed to forgive your brother for uh, the same thing, but the fourth time, forgiveness was no longer extended. And beyond that, Jesus had told a story in one of the other Gospels about forgiving seven times in one day. So I think Peter jumped on the number seven as the new normal for forgiveness. And so he thought that seven would be a good number. So Jesus tells the story of the servant who was forgiven a debt that he could never have repaid. And after he received the forgiveness, he went out and demanded one of his very small loans to be repaid. And when his fellow servant could not pay it, he took him by the throat. So the king, in, a, in anger, after hearing the report that the other servants brought to him, delivered him to the tormentors till he should pay all that was due to him. And Jesus said, in a very sobering few sentences, in the same way, my heavenly Father will do this to you if you don't forgive from your heart your brother's trespasses. And we're a little more used to hearing the words of Jesus when he speaks comfort and peace. When he says, neither do I condemn thee, go and sin no more. But when Jesus encounters the self-righteous, his language becomes very harsh. I will deliver you to the tormentors if you do not forgive your brother. James 2.13, for he shall have judgment without mercy that hath shown no mercy. And Jesus is saying, if we are unforgiving toward our brother, he will be unforgiving toward us. Now, in my mind, and I think in our minds, we view 
uh, for instance, adultery as sin with a capital S. And we view uh, lust contained in our own hearts as sin with a small s. We view murder as sin with a big S. And we view hating our brother as sin with a small s. Stealing, again, big S. But covetousness and selfishness, a sin with a small s, just a small debt. We view their sin as the unpayable debt. And we view my sin as a small loan. It barely even needs to be repaid. It was just $5 for a sandwich. But Jesus could forgive the adulteress, and he, for, he could forgive the cheating tax collector. He could even forgive the thief on the cross, saying, Today you will be with me in paradise. But he was crystal clear in Matthew 5.20 that except your righteousness shall exceed the righteousness of the scribes and Pharisees, you shall in no case enter into the kingdom of heaven. In Luke 18, verse 10, and John Lewis talked about this two weeks ago, two men went up into the temple to pray, the one a Pharisee and the other a publican. And the Pharisee stood and prayed thus with himself, God, I thank thee that I am not as other men are, extortioners, unjust, adulterers, or even as this publican. I fast twice a week. I give tithes tithes of all that I possess. And the publican, standing afar off, would not lift up so much as his eyes unto heaven, but spoke upon his breast, saying, God, be merciful to me, a sinner. I tell you, this man went down to his house justified rather than the other. For everyone that exalteth himself shall be abased, and he that humbleth himself shall be exalted. My sin of self-righteousness is the massive debt. My sin of self-righteousness is the big debt. I had no way to pay my debt, and I was under condemnation. I was doomed for destruction. Ephesians chapter 2 describes this very well, and I've personalized these verses a bit. I was dead in trespasses and sins, wherein in times past I walked according to the course of this world, according to the prince of the power of the air, the spirit that now worketh in the children of disobedience among whom also I had my conversation in times past in the lust of my flesh, fulfilling the desires of my flesh and of my mind, and was by nature a child of wrath, even as others. But God, who is rich in mercy, for his great love, wherewith he loved me, even when I was dead in sins, hath quickened me together with Christ. By grace I am saved. How do I miss the fact that I am the unforgiving servant. I am the one with the large debt. After I have tasted of the water of life and the abundant grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, I am taking my fellow servant by the throat and demanding that he pay me back. Now Jesus responds to Peter's question about how often we should forgive or just how much grace we we should extend by telling him this story of the unforgiving servant. And I think Jesus is telling us Stop taking those by the throat who owe you a nickel when you were raised from the death of your own self-righteous grave by the tender, rich, merciful, abundant grace of God. And your insurmountable debt was wiped out. So why did Peter ask this question in the first place? You'll notice that earlier in the conversation, Jesus said in verse 10, Take heed that you despise not one of these little ones. For I say unto you that in heaven their angels do always behold the face of my Father which is in heaven. For the Son of Man is come to save that which was lost. How think ye, if a man have a hundred sheep, and one, go, one, one of them be gone astray, doth he not leave the ninety and nine, and goeth into the mountains, and seeketh that which was gone astray? And if so be that he find it, verily I say unto you, he rejoiceth more of that sheep than of the ninety and nine which went not astray. Even so, it is not the will of your Father which is in heaven that one of these little ones should perish. If the shepherd finds the lost sheep, he rejoices more over the one sheep than over the ninety-nine that went not astray. And our self-righteousness kicks in right about here. 
And we say, wait a minute, that makes no sense whatsoever. There were 99 sheep there who weren't, who weren't lost. They obeyed the voice of the master. They followed his call. And yet he rejoices more over the one lost sheep than over the whole fold full of sheep. I think this example given by Jesus was not lost on Peter and the, the disciples. They understood shepherding, and they understood the comfort and safety of the fold. They understood the, the cold, dark, lonely, dangerous wilderness at night, and the risk that the shepherd put himself in to find this lost sheep. And I think Peter is thinking, how often... Do I need to leave that comfortable fold and go out into the dark, lonely, cold wilderness to search for my brother? And he thinks that seven times would be extremely gracious, basically twice the legal limit of forgiveness necessary. And Jesus says, well, uh, I say not unto you seven times, but 70 times seven would be a good place to start. Jesus continued in verse 15. Moreover, if thy brother shall trespass against thee, go and tell him his fault between thee and him alone. If he shall hear thee, thou hast gained thy brother. But if he shall not hear thee, then take with thee one or two more, that in the mouth of two or three witnesses every word may be established. And if he shall neglect to hear them, tell it to the church. And if he neglect to hear the church, let him be unto thee as an heathen man and a publican. And I think Peter was beginning to connect the dots and his mind was, or his mouth was uh, like mine working a little faster than his mind. Um, but he wondered, how often does he need to do this process of reconciliation when he comes to the altar? How often does he need to follow this three-step process towards reconciliation? And like Peter, I say seven times seems very gracious for one individual. And Jesus said, how about we start with 70 times 7? And he drives home this point with a parable of the unforgiving servant who experienced life instead of death and turned around and took his fellow servants by the throat and demanded retribution. The heart of our Heavenly Father is bent towards reconciliation. He has poured out the riches of his grace freely into our lives, and he wishes for us to be ambassadors of reconciliation and grace, to participate in reconciliation with each other. The title for the sermon today is Be Reconciled. And I've broken it down into three sections. Uh, we want to look a little bit at what reconciliation is, and the second part is what hinders reconciliation, and the third part is the ministry of reconciliation, the practical part of being an advocate. Well, reconciliation is the restoration of friendly relations. And Romans 5, uh, 6 through 11, which I will read, explains this to us. For when we were yet without sin, in due time Christ died for the ungodly. For scarcely for, for a righteous man will one die, Yet peradventure for a good man some would even dare to die. But God commendeth his love toward us, in that while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. Much more then, being now justified by his blood, we shall be saved from the wrath through him. For if when we were enemies, we were reconciled to God by the death of his son, much more being reconciled, we shall be saved by his life. And not only so, but we also joy in God through our Lord Jesus Christ, by whom we have now received the atonement. Reconciliation is taking an enemy of the king and making him an heir together with Christ. Who needs to be reconciled? 2 Corinthians 5.14 For the love of Christ constraineth us, because we, we thus judge that if one died for all, then we're all dead, and that he died for all, that they which should live should not henceforth live unto themselves, but unto him which died for them and rose again. Wherefore, henceforth know we no man after the flesh. Yea, though we have known Christ after the flesh, yet now henceforth know we him no more. Therefore, if any man be in Christ, he is a new creature. 
Old things are passed away. Behold, all things are become new. We all need reconciliation. We were all at enmity with Christ. I need to be reconciled. My sin is sin with a capital S. I am the servant who has been forgiven much. My debt was a large debt. What was I reconciled from? In Ephesians 2.12, that at that time you were without Christ, being aliens from the commonwealth of Israel, strangers from the covenant of promise, having no hope and without God in the world. But now in Christ Jesus, you who, you who sometimes were far off are made nigh by the blood of Christ. For he is our peace, who hath made both one, and hath broken down the middle wall of partition between us, having abolished in his flesh the enmity, even the law of commandments contained in ordinances, for to make in himself of twain one new man, so making peace, and that he may reconcile both unto God in one body by the cross, having slain the enmity thereby, and came and preached peace to, the, to you which were far off and to them that were nigh. For through him we both have access by one spirit unto the Father. Now therefore you are no more strangers and foreigners, but fellow citizens with the saints and of the household of God, and are built upon the foundation of the apostles and prophets, Jesus Christ himself being the chief cornerstone, in whom all the building fitly framed together groweth unto an holy temple in the Lord, in whom also you are built together for an habitation of God through the Spirit. We were reconciled. We were brought from being far off to being made nigh, by the blood of Christ, from separation from Christ to being made one by the cross, from being on the wrong side of the wall to having the wall that separated us from Christ removed, from being at enmity because of the law to Christ slaying the enmity and removing it. We went from strangers to family and from foreigners to fellow citizens, from being illegitimate children to being children of the king. Christ did all of that for us. And we already looked at Romans chapter 5, but I want to just go back a little bit to Romans chapter 5 and look at how and when I was reconciled. Chapter 5, verse 6 says, When we were without strength and when we were ungodly, Christ died. In verse 8, while we were still sinners, Christ died for us. Verse 10, when we were enemies, we were reconciled to God by the death of his son. In 2 Corinthians 5.21 it says, For he hath made him to be sin for us who knew no sin, that we might be made the righteousness of God in him. And because we have been reconciled to God, we are to reconcile others. 2 Corinthians 5.18 And all things are of God who hath reconciled us to himself by Jesus Christ and hath given to us the ministry of reconciliation, to wit that God was in Christ, reconciling the world unto himself, not imputing their trespasses unto them, and hath committed unto us the word of reconciliation. Now then, we are ambassadors for Christ, as though God did beseech you by us. We pray you in Christ's stead, be reconciled to God. And those of us who have been reconciled, have a unique ministry of reconciliation to others, both to God and to each other. Matthew 5.23 says, Therefore, if thou bring thy gift to the altar, and there rememberest that the brother hath aught against thee, leave there thy gift before the altar, and go thy way. First be reconciled to thy brother, and then come and offer thy gift. Now, let's remind ourselves of what the altar and the gift were for. In Leviticus 6, the Lord through Moses gives clear instruction that when an Israelite trespassed the law, he could, uh, the priest could intercede for him, but atonement needed to be made in the form of a ram. And so they brought a ram with no blemish, and the priest would make atonement for this individual before the Lord. And so you come to the altar to be reconciled to God. And there's a story in 2 Samuel 24. David sinned before the Lord in numbering the people. 
Then in verse 10 it says, And David's heart smote him after that he had numbered the people. And David said unto the Lord, I have sinned greatly in that I have done. And now I beseech thee, O Lord, take away the iniquity of thy servant. For I have done very foolishly. And when David was up in the morning, the word of the Lord came unto the prophet Gad, David's seer, saying, Go and say unto David, Thus saith the Lord, I offer three things. Choose thee one of them, that I may do it unto thee. So Gad came to David and told him, and said unto him, Shall seven years of famine come unto thee in thy land? Or wilt thou flee three months before thine enemies while they pursue thee? Or that there be three days pestilence in thy land? Now advise, and see what answer I shall return to him that sent me. And David said unto Gad, I am in a great strait. Let us fall now into the hand of the Lord, for his mercies are great. And let me not fall into the hand of man. So the Lord sent pestilence upon Israel from morning even to the time appointed. And there died of the people from Dan to Beersheba, 70,000 men. And when the angel stretched out his hand upon Jerusalem to destroy it, the Lord repented him of the evil and said to the angel that destroyed the people, it is enough, stay now thine hand. And the angel of the Lord was by the threshing, threshing place of Aruna the Jebusite. And David spake unto the Lord when he saw the angel that smote the people and said, Lo, I have sinned, and I have done wickedly. But these sheep, what have they done? Let thine hand, I pray thee, be against me and against my father's house. And Gad came today, today, that day to David and said unto him, Go up and rear an altar unto the Lord in the threshing floor of Aruna the Jebusite. And David, according to the saying of Gad, went up as the Lord commanded. And jumping down to verse 25, it says, David built there an altar unto the Lord and offered burnt offerings and peace offerings. So the Lord was entreated for the land and the plague was stayed from Israel. The point I'm trying to make is that the altar is the place where they went to be reconciled to God. It's where their sins were atoned for. If you wanted reconciliation, you went to the altar. And Jesus is saying in Matthew 5, when you are at the altar, when you are asking for forgiveness for your sin, when you're bringing your gift to the altar, and you realize that, you, that someone has trespassed against you, or that you have ought against a brother, leave and first be reconciled to your brother, and then come and be reconciled to God. I find it strangely eerie that this is almost word for word what my mother used to tell me when I brought a complaint to her. She would say, go straight to your room and don't come out until you're ready to say you're sorry. And in a sense, that's what God is telling us. We would like to come and receive grace and forgiveness at the hand of God. But we're withholding that from our, from our brothers. And God says, until we're willing to reconcile our relationships with our brothers, that he's not willing to, to reconcile our debt. And I wonder if we're able to grasp the, 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 the seriousness of this statement. And I wonder if we here are unable to grasp the grace of our Heavenly Father because we remain unreconciled to an individual here on earth. Unreconciled relationships between saints build walls in our relationship with our Savior. Be reconciled and then come and offer the gift. How many times have I fallen at the altar begging for mercy? I let the clear, cold, refreshing forgiveness, the living water flow over me. And I get up from the altar, and I turn around, and I grab my fellow servant by the throat. In order to worship the Savior properly, properly we need to be reconciled with each other. Otherwise, we are just like the unjust servant. To be reconciled to each other and to God must be a priority of the life of an ambassador of God. Now, the second part, I'd like to look at several things that prevent reconciliation. 
Uh, first of all, I think it's easy for us to understand that if we don't recognize the extent of our debt and the riches of the grace that we have received, it's hard to pass that along to those around us. And we see that in the parable of the unjust steward. <clears throat> and sometimes, if you're like me, you, you fail to see the seriousness of your sin. You think you're a pretty good person. Um, I was raised in a God-centered home with loving Christian parents. I had every opportunity in this church and school and community to, be, um, to choose the right. I had every opportunity you could possibly imagine. But through Adam and the fall of man, we received the curse of death. And it is only through the second Adam, Jesus Christ, that our sin debt can be reconciled. And if we deny the gift of God and salvation through Christ, there is no other way to be reconciled. We can't do this through any power of our own. 1 Corinthians 15, 20, But now is Christ risen from the dead and become the firstfruits of them that slept. For since by man came death, by man came also the resurrection from the dead. For as in Adam all die, even so in Christ shall all be made alive. And so often I forget that I owe the big debt. My debt can never be repaid on my own. I'm the servant who was forgiven much. And what am I doing with that grace? Am I extending that grace to others or am I grabbing them by the throat and demanding retribution? We cannot extend grace that we have not received. Another thing that prevents reconciliation in our lives is the fact that it's hard for us to die to self. In order to reconcile and be reconciled, we need to be willing to die. Death brings reconciliation, and reconciliation brings life. And we, it's not hard for us to see the need for Christ. Um, he needed to die to repay our debt. It took his life. And we appreciate that. But it's difficult for us to give up our own life. And unless we're willing to do that, we will not be able to be reconciled in the way that Christ reconciled us to himself. Failing to die to self is likely the number one hindrance in me reconciling with my brother. Matthew 16, 24, Jesus told his disciples, If anyone would come after me, let him deny himself and take up his cross and follow me. For whoever shall save his life will lose it, but whoever loses his life for my sake shall find it. Luke 14, 27. Whoever does not bear his own cross and come after me cannot be my disciple. Galatians 5, 24. And those who belong to Christ have crucified the flesh with its passions and desires. In Galatians 2, 20. I have been crucified with Christ. It is no longer I who live but Christ who lives, lives in me and the life I now live in the flesh, I live by faith in the Son of God who loved me and gave himself for me. There's another thing that hinders reconciliation. And this is, I think, um, partly due to our memory. We fear, and we fear change. Um, we fear the result of grace. And this is a little hard for me to understand, but we see this illustrated in Mark chapter 5 when Jesus was in the country of the Gadarenes and he uh, met a man in the tombs who had an unclean spirit. And no one could bound, could, he couldn't be bound with fetters and chains and he, he broke free from everything that, that they put on him. And when Jesus, when, when Jesus met this man, um, let me just read uh, what the demon-possessed man said. What have I to do with thee, Jesus, thou son of the most high God? I adjure thee by God that thou torment me not. For he had said unto them, Come out of the man, thou unclean spirit, and ask him, What is thy name? And he answered, saying, My name is Legion, for we are many. And he besought him much that he would not send them away out of the country. And so Jesus uh, decided to send the, this legion of demons into the, the pigs who were nearby and they ran into the sea and the people that saw this went and told the village and so the whole village comes out to see Jesus 
And it says, they came to see Jesus and see him that was possessed with the devil and had a legion sitting and clothed and in his right mind. And they were afraid. And they saw that it told, <clears throat> they saw that, and they that saw it told them how it befell him who was possessed with the devil and also concerning the swine. And they began to pray him to depart out of their coasts. And I'm not exactly sure how to respond to this story. But I'm afraid that sometimes when we, when we come face to face with this drastic amount of grace that was given to this man, we don't know how to react. And so we're fearful. And it's almost as if we would rather see this man as our memory has always um, remembered that he was. It's almost as if we have him in a box and we don't want him to get out. We remember that he's a failure and he's possessed. And when we see him sitting and clothed in his right mind, we're fearful for some reason. It makes more sense to our rational minds and our self-righteous heart to keep people in their current state. Well, there's another thing that hinders reconciliation, and I'm going to call this hybrid theology. And I think we all understand what hybrid cars are. Um, when acceleration is needed and power is needed, it, it uses fuel or gas. And then when you're cruising along at, uh, on the highway, you can switch to electric and save energy. And um, hybrid theology, um, and this is something that the term that I've made up, but, but I think it's something that we deal with at least to some extent. Hybrid theology is where we understand that we're saved by grace. That takes great power. And we realize that that's apart from ourselves. But once we've hit cruising speed, we somehow think that our own effort can keep us saved. After all, we don't want to use up all of God's resources. There's people who have bigger debts than we do. And we want to allow him to use his grace for them. I think that one of our greatest weaknesses is being able to accept humbly the free gift of grace. Which is paradoxically our greatest need. Now I don't think I would ever tell you that I've fallen prey to the hybrid theology. But it manifests itself in my self-righteous attitude towards others. And I'm going to step out on a limb here and say this. I think that too much focus on us can cause us to trust in ourselves and coast along in our hybrid theology. Too much focus on our heritage, our background, and our culture at the expense of the truth of Scripture can cause us to develop a hybrid theology. And it works against reconciliation. In John chapter 6, I'll just read John chapter 6, verse 28. Then they said unto him, What shall we do that we might work the works of God? And Jesus answered and said unto them, This is the work of God, that ye believe on him whom he hath sent. And these people wanted a sign from Jesus, and they bragged about how Moses provided manna for their fathers in the wilderness and preserved them. And Jesus said, Verily, verily, I say unto you, He that believeth on me hath everlasting life. I am that bread of life. Your fathers did eat man in the wilderness, and they are dead. This is the bread which cometh down from heaven, that a man may eat thereof and not die. I am the living bread which came down from heaven. If any man eat of this bread, he shall live forever. And the bread that I will give is my flesh, which I will give for the life of the world. And the disciples were offended by Jesus talking about them eating his flesh and drinking his blood. And so he made it clear to them later on. In verse 60, it says, Many therefore of his disciples, when they heard this, said, This is a hard saying. Who can hear it? And when Jesus knew in himself that his disciples murmured at it, he said unto them, Doth this offend you? What and if you shall see the Son of Man ascended up where he was before? It is the Spirit that quickeneth or gives life, and the flesh profiteth nothing. The words that I speak unto you, they are spirit, and they are life. In Galatians chapter 3, they had a real problem with hybrid theology. 
And Paul says in verse 1, O foolish Galatians, who hath bewitched you that you should obey not the truth, that you should obey not the truth before whose eyes Jesus Christ hath been evidently set forth, crucified among you? This only would I learn of you. Received you the Spirit by the works of the law or by the hearing of faith? Are you so foolish? Having begun in the Spirit, are you now made perfect by the flesh? Have you suffered so many things in vain, if it be yet in vain? He therefore that ministereth to you the Spirit, and worketh miracles among you, doth it not, doeth he it by the works of the law, or by the hearing of faith? Even as Abraham believed God, and it was accounted to him for righteousness. And the Galatians have fallen for the trap of salvation through faith but attempting to live out that Christian life by their own effort rather than day-by-day -day devotion and fellowship with God. And Paul says, if you started out in the Spirit, why go back to your own effort? Ephesians 2, 8 and 9, For by grace are you saved through faith, and this is not from yourselves, it is the gift of God. It is not of works, so that no one can boast. And of course, we're not saying that we should not participate in good works. Paul says in 1 Timothy 4, 7, that we are to exercise or train yourself in godliness. It's just that when it comes to salvation, our own effort is nothing. Faith plus works does not equal salvation. But rather, our works are a result and an expression of the faith and the work of Christ in our lives. There's no room for boasting because even the desire, it says in Philippians 2.13, the desire and the will to do good is given to us by God. Another uh, attitude that prevents reconciliation is, I'm going to call this the Jonah complex. Jonah, we remember, received a word from the Lord and he was to go to Nineveh and preach against the city. He was to cry against it, because the wickedness is come up before me, said the Lord. So Jonah rose up, and he went to Tarshish. He fled, because he didn't want to go to Nineveh. And we know the story of Jonah. He uh, went on the ship. They encountered a storm. He was thrown into the water and swallowed by a fish. And in Jonah chapter 2, he starts out with a prayer. Then Jonah prayed unto the Lord his God out of the fish's belly and said, I cried by reason of my affliction unto the Lord, and he heard me. Out of the belly of hell cried I, and thou heardest my voice. And later on, um, yet thou hast brought up my life from corruption, O Lord my God. When my soul fainted within me, I remembered the Lord, and my prayer came in unto thee, into thine holy temple. They that, they that observe lying vanities forsake their own mercy. Now listen to this next phrase. But I will sacrifice unto thee with a voice of thanksgiving. I will pay that that I have vowed. Salvation is of the Lord. And the Lord spake unto the fish, and it vomited out Jonah upon dry land. Did you catch that? He wanted to be before the altar. He wanted to sacrifice so that he could make atonement for his sin. And he was grateful for the salvation that he received. And so in chapter 3, he continues and receives a word from the Lord the second time. And the Lord says, Arise, go into Nineveh, that great city, and preach unto it the preaching that I bid thee. So Jonah arose and went unto Nineveh, according to the word of the Lord. Now Nineveh was an exceeding great city of three days' journey, and Jonah began to enter into the city a day's journey. Then he cried and said, Yet forty days, and Nineveh shall be overthrown. Now, in verse 5, the people believed his um, rebuke from the Lord. They believed God, and it was made evident by their actions, and their belief led to repentance, and they said, who knows, maybe God will change his mind. And God did. God did change his mind. They believed, they repented, and they lived. And in chapter 4, it says, it displeased Jonah exceedingly, and he was very angry. And he told God, this is the reason I didn't come in the first place, because I knew that you were merciful and that you would repent and you wouldn't carry out um, the destruction of the city of Nineveh. 
And the Lord asks him a question. He says, do us out well to be angry? You remember that Jonah, just uh, a few verses before, was exceedingly grateful for the salvation that he had received. He wanted to be before the altar, and he wanted to give his gift in gratefulness to God. Salvation is of the Lord. So he was, he was very grateful for his own personal salvation, but um, was angry about the salvation that was extended to others. And I don't know of any other missionary that wanted to go and preach to a people and not have them repent. Or do I? I think sometimes I would like to see people receive what they deserve. And God has given me a message and then extends grace to them and I become angry. Now, is it possible that one of the reasons that we don't make more of an effort to reconcile each other is because we know the heart of God and we know that he's merciful and 70 times 7 is just too often for us. And we're scared that God will forgive. We become the self-righteous brother in the story of the loving father and the prodigal son. When the lost son returns home, we're really not into a party. We've been here all along. What's the, what's the fuss? And it makes no sense to us when God rejoices over the lost son when we were here all along. And it bothers us in our self-righteousness. Jonah was excited about the message of destruction, but he was discouraged because he knew that God is gracious. Jonah would rather see them judged by God than reconciled to God. He was grateful for his own deliverance, but angry when Nineveh was delivered. In Matthew 5, verse 23 and in Matthew 5, verse 18, are similar passages. And in Matthew 5, my brother has something against me, which indicates that I may have trespassed against him. And in Matthew uh, 18, my brother has trespassed against me. In both passages, I am responsible to reconcile. God calls me to reconcile. I should leave the altar and go and be reconciled. If I'm at the altar... And God brings something to mind that needs to be reconciled, something or someone, it is then my responsibility, not the other person's, to be reconciled. And Jesus has a formula for success in reconciliation, and he gives us opportunities. And we can see that um, we're to go to the person alone and see if we can work out the differences and reconcile it in that way. If that doesn't work, take one or two others with you. And if that doesn't work, we take it to the church. And there's a formula there for reconciliation done properly. But we're not excited about this process, especially seven times, let alone 70 times seven. It's just too much work. And who knows, maybe God will forgive, and we're not sure if we can handle that. We're like Jonah, and we would rather see retribution than reconciliation. We're grateful for our salvation, but we're okay with others receiving their due reward. And we appreciate that God doesn't count our sin against us, but it seems fair to us, for some people at least, to receive that retribution for their sin. So in order to be ambassadors, we have a choice. We can be an advocate, or we can be an adversary. An advocate is one who supports, or recommends, or stands up for another person. An adversary is one's opponent in a dispute. In 1 Peter 5.8 it says, Be sober, be vigilant, because your adversary the devil, as a roaring lion, walketh about, seeking whom he may devour. In John 2.1 it says, My little children, these things write unto you that ye sin not. And if any man sin, we have an advocate with the Father, Jesus Christ the righteous. 
So we have an adversary who opposes us, and we have an advocate who stands for us and recommends us to the Father. Who are we being ambassadors of? Are we joining Christ in the ministry of reconciliation? Are we being an advocate? Are we co-laboring with him in the work of reconciliation? Or are we a minister of the devil? Is our adversarial attitude being used by Satan? Who are we ambassador to? Now, let me just get real practical here for our congregation. And it's time to close, so I'm going to jump down to this very practical part because I think it's important for us. We're here as a body, and we want to be unified, and we want to be reconciled because I think, um, in my understanding, if we are not reconciled to each other, it's very difficult, nearly impossible, or perhaps impossible to be reconciled to God. And I think we can do better than what we're currently doing in the ministry of reconciliation. I think some of us have given up on reconciliation. We've discontinued being an advocate for those around us and have instead become adversaries. Now, I will admit that when I'm trying to make a point in a sermon, uh, maybe I drive the, the point home a little too hard to make that point. And so forgive me if, if I do that here. But um, there's a certain group of people here that I am concerned about because I'm about to join them. And um, I think that for children who have, or sorry, for parents who have youth-age children, there is a tremendous amount of peer pressure. And there is a tremendous amount of unity and working together that is needed to accomplish faithfully this stage in life. And maybe I'm just scared to move to that stage. I don't know. But in my observation, I think we can do better in advocating for each other through this stage. I think too often we become adversaries. And please understand me. This is not a word for the youth group. This is a word for their parents. We do not need to be adversaries. We need to be advocates. We need to work together, be mature, and reconcile where we need to so that we can be reconciled to God. Matthew 6.14, For if you forgive men their trespasses, your heavenly Father will also forgive you. But if ye forgive not men their trespasses, neither will your Father forgive your trespasses. Mark eleven twenty five. And when you stand praying, forgive, if you have anything against any, that your Father also, who is in heaven, may forgive your trespasses. But if you do not forgive, neither will your Father, who is in heaven, forgive your trespasses. I want to read a few verses in Exodus chapter 32. Will you please stand with me? Turn in your Bibles to Exodus chapter 32. I'm going to close with these verses and then I'll lead in prayer. Exodus chapter 32 and verse 31. God had had it with the people of Israel. And in verse 31, Moses returned unto the Lord and said, Oh, this people have sinned a great sin and have made them gods of gold. And listen to what Moses says. Yet now, if thou wilt forgive their sin, and if not, blot me, I pray thee, out of thy book, which thou hast written. I'm amazed at the level of commitment Moses had for his people. And if we would even come close to that, we could do a better job at advocating for each other. And I have faith that we can. And the the glorious thing to me is that even the sin of self-righteousness that I have in my life can be forgiven. 
Praise God. Let's pray. Father, thank you for the example of Moses uh, that we see here in being willing to extend himself to the point of having his own name blotted out of the book of life to save the people that he was leading. And I pray that as we lead our families and our um, our church here, uh, our sphere of influence, I pray that we could be reconciled with each other. And I pray that we would be less adversarial in our relationships and more of an advocate. Help us to lift others to your throne. Help us to recommend, support them, and to reconcile relationships here on earth so that we can have a pure, open uh, relationship with you, our Father in heaven. I pray that you would give us wisdom and grace as we attempt to do this. And as we think of things in our lives that need to be forgiven and reconciled, I pray that you would give us the, the strength and the grace and the, the willingness to do this in a way that is pleasing to you rather than adversarial. Help us, Lord, to do this in a right way. In Jesus' name, amen. You may be seated.